today we're doing we've got a netflix themed kind of uh presentation today so um netflix started this new program um for documentary filmmakers to train um people to become archival researchers and so it's really cool and a few of you applied I know um Rowan got into the inaugural group that just had their training last week and so it was like a three-day training and she's here to tell you all about it and Lizzie McGlynn she was the facilitator for it um, so you're going to hear all about her. And so if you have any questions about being a archival producer, basically, um, Lizzie can tell you all about that and how to get into it. And she's got lots of information that she would love you to steal and use. I believe that <laughs> that was her words. <laughs> okay, Rowan, take it away. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Rowan. I'm going to share my screen because I have a little PowerPoint. Um, so I got to find it. But let's see. Show all windows. Here it is. Optimize. There we go. So that's my email. Sorry, guys. Okay. So like Shana said, I got into this program um, for DART. Documentary Archival Research Training Program. Also, if you don't know who I am, I'm Rowan. Uh, I went to Syracuse. I graduated in May, December. Um, graduated in December, walked in May. Um, but I got into this program. Shana sent it to me, and I applied. And I'm here to tell you all about it. Um, let's see. Well, no, it doesn't want to work. Okay, we're just going to do it like this. Because it works better this way. Um... So I want to talk about what I did in college and what I do now, just to show you like what experience I had before I went into this program. Um, so in college, I was able to go to Italy um, with the World War II Foundation and travel and film with them um, for three of their documentaries. One was about the Tuskegee Airmen, which came out in May on PBS. And then we also have another one coming out in November about the Bob Senator Bob Dole and his um, fight in Italy. And then I think we just did, they're also putting together um, just a general overview of uh, the war in Italy um, during the World War II. Um, so a lot of what I knew about documentaries came from that experience. It was an amazing one. Um, the uh, director and um, photographer um, was, was there and it was just amazing to be in those places as well as just filming. Um, also, Italy is amazing. So it was just a really fun time. The food was really good. Um, but then I went into my senior year and um, we still edited for World War II Foundation. We did our own little side projects, which were really exciting. Um, but then I also did my capstone on women in the Algerian War. Um, and that was hugely archival. I think we just filmed a couple different parts of that. Um, and all I knew from uh, that was how to use, how to go on the internet and search for um, archival film. But that was a great introduction and in licensing and copyright and all that. Um, so now I work at a, um, a local news station. I'm a production assistant um, and I didn't study broadcast. So it's I've studied film, so it's a little different, but I like to think of it as a real time um, documentarian uh, because I'm like we're, I'm helping assist in documentary documenting um, the history that is currently happening. Um, so everything that's happening, especially local news, which tends to be kind of forgotten, um, but that is that is like that is how I like to think about it. Um, and then I also am a freelancer at um, uh, Fox Fifty Six, another another news station local, um, for their sports. And that is I'm helping um, assist in the live games. Um, we do live coverage of high school and college um, games in my area in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and that I like to think about is how I'm highlighting local talent, because um, a lot of these high schoolers don't uh, have, we don't have the ESPN, like it's not like that. Um, we're not even, even the local colleges, they're not D1, so they're not getting covered. So we like to cover them. And that's really exciting just to like be able to highlight those, um, those young, young people. Um, and then I'm currently working on a indie documentary with Jacob, who's on the call. 
but we're working on um, a, a film right now and it's been really fun because I've been doing, um, actually I've been the one finding the footage and just helping uh, getting this project going and just trying to put it all together and it's really exciting and Jacob's writing it. Um, so I'm having a great experience, especially because I work in broadcast. So that kind of gets me back into the film sides of side of thing. Um, so then what I knew about archival film and documentaries before, um, it was really just internet searches. Critical Pass was on a website that um, the World War II Foundation uses, as well as Getty, and um, just using things to license. Um, and I only thought you could really uh, license images, audio, and video, so I really didn't think that much about it. Um, and I really didn't think much about fair use. Um, as a student, you were just, you know, you take your law classes and it's probably not till your senior year anyways. So I really was scared about, you know, I didn't have a lawyer, so it was really only fair use. I mean, it was really only licensed, so that's how I would think of it. And also it was only used in documentaries, that archival film was only used in documentaries, which isn't the case. Um, you can use it for a bunch of different things. You can use it um, in a film that isn't a documentary, and it can just be something that the production doesn't want to shoot, and they just find a third party um, that has, has it already filmed. Um, so that was what I knew before I got into this program, and then I got into this program, which was really exciting. Um, I applied, um, you had to answer a couple questions about yourself and why you were interested in this program. Um, and yeah, that was, it was really, I was really excited when I got in. Um, and then I just want to talk about what is it. So like Shana said, it's a documentary archival researcher training program. It's a development program intended to give individuals from underrecognized backgrounds the skill set necessary to be strong candidates um, for entry level positions in documentaries. Um, and we had our three day virtual seminar last week um, that had hands on learning experiences with amazing people. Um, professionals in the in the in documentaries and we um it was help it was to help us lead, have a pathway to learn about different opportunities in the industry as well as just aiding our growth for filmmaking journey so me and 24 other people had an amazing experience with our facilitator facilitator lizzie lizzie if you want to introduce yourself please go ahead uh, hi, I'm Lizzie and I was, um, I'm Lizzie McGlynn. I've been doing documentary films for about 20 years and I started out kind of soup to nuts the way most of you probably are right now and ended up um, focusing solely on archival. So that's my jam, um, all archival, all the time. <laughs> uh, it is a very important path that has been under-recognized in the past. So one of the reasons that Netflix decided to do this seminar is to raise awareness that this is its own kind of career within the documentary film industry. So while we're all doing soup to nuts documentary, and as Rowan said so eloquently, she's doing all these different things and has this idea about what archival is, as people are proceeding to do larger and larger films, um, films that are entirely made up of archival, they realize that they need somebody who's very specifically devoted to that aspect of the filmmaking. So we, we uh, uh, Netflix contacted me about six months ago and we developed a seminar over the course of many months uh, to try to introduce this area of filmmaking that people don't often think about as a singular career path. And I'd encourage all of you just to know that there is room in this area. <laughs> um, it's a growth area within documentary because uh, not, uh, not that many people have focused on this particular skill. So Rowan was learning about it and we're hoping that she, along with some of her cohort, will go, will come and apply to work on some of the films that we make. Um, I do a lot of stuff for the streamers and now these days I do primarily um, independent film. So it's not necessarily attached to a streamer at the beginning. And then we take it to market and it finds a streamer. But in the past I've done PBS, Netflix, um, uh, HBO, Cinema, uh, not Cinemax, uh, CNN Max, which is now HBO. It's all the same. I don't know. <laughs> They're all the same now, right? There's only six of them. <laughs> I think I've got something on all of them. Um, but anyhow, um, uh, I'm here just to support Rowan, and I'm excited to hear how she's going to describe what she went through. <laughs> I 
feel like you're selling yourself short. I see those Emmys behind you. Um, she's Emmy award winning. So please like, please like, I feel like she just sold herself short, but she worked on amazing documentaries, which we're going to see because she used examples, which I think was really great to use examples from what you worked on um, to show us because it was like nice to see how that process was. Um, so we're going to show some of that too, which is really exciting. Um, so then we're going to talk more about like what exactly Lizzie does, but like archival research and producing, it's shaping a story through archival material, such as photos, audio letters, um, newsreels, newspapers, and archival film. It's not just photos and film. It's There's a lot more to it. Um, and it's anything that's third party. So it's basically production doesn't want to shoot this. They're going to come to an archival producer, say, hey, can we maybe like find something um, that's third party that we don't have to film and if they can find it and license it and it's in the budget, then they're going to probably use it. Um, you also need to, as an archival producer, you need to make it legal for production. Um, sometimes it <laughs> it's not always legal and it can be really hard, but you need to have a host of skills to be able to do all of this. So um, you need to be kind of like a lawyer, you need to know a little bit of law. Um, you're going to be dealing with a lot of lawyers. Um, you need to know um, about post-production and production because you're going to be working with production team as well as post-production, the editors, VFX crew um, to help um, send the footage, but then also to see what needs to be done in order to be able like to ha have it in your log, basically. Um, you also have to collect every single item and log it into a database, like I just said. Um, so that way that it's organized and it's a healthy project. Um, you need to have a little bit of knowledge about expenses because you're going to like archival film is not not cheap at all. Um, but you also need to know who owns the footage and then who owns the copyright, which I didn't even realize was different. That's another thing I learned. So I didn't realize that someone who owns the footage um, may not also own the copyright, which is very interesting to me. I had no idea. But um, if you can start a project and collect the footage and organize it, then you're going to have a really good product uh, product at the end that is not full of legal problems and is a healthy, really healthy project. Um, Lizzie, can we stop sharing and talk about the Summer of Soul clip? Um, this sure. is a great clip. Um, just really quickly, it's a great clip. Um, Lizzie worked on it and it's, uh, it's just showing how archival film is used and then like how different um, new stations deal with the licensing and stuff. So I'm going to stop sharing. She's going to show the clip. It's a great yeah. clip. I love the editing of it. Too. Yeah, this clip is really impressive. This film won the Oscar for a documentary, although you might have missed it because I think like somebody slapped somebody. I don't know. It was a weird moment in the Oscars history. Um, but for <laughs> me and our team, it was supposedly like, you know, career changing. Um, but I don't have an Oscar. I have this little plastic one that my neighbor got me. So <laughs> uh, I was not named on that Oscar, which is fine everything's fine um <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna just tell you why in fact um I choose this particular clip to show um partially because I feel like this clip is full of joy this clip is and it shows a lot of different aspects of uh you can see my archive behind there uh it shows a lot of different aspects of what's interesting and important about um about how archival footage can be incorporated and i often say when we're introducing this clip that uh and especially with summer of soul in particular this is the kind of film where we used a lot of iconic moments in history just to contextualize what was happening at this concert so the concert just to give you a very brief overview this is like the elevator pitch essentially uh in 1969 there was a concert that was spread over six separate weekends um the it was called the Harlem Cultural Festival, and it was essentially a lot of Black musicians playing in a park that was then called Mount Morris Park. And at Mount Morris Park, all of these people gathered to watch these musicians, many of whom were extraordinarily famous already, and many of whom were a little less famous, but who had all come here just to perform. Um, the footage was definitely shown. Don't believe what you hear all the time. <laughs> People say it's never before a scene. No, it was seen. It was actually played on national television um, at the time. The producer who filmed it put it on national television. But 
Um, after that, he made licensing it so difficult and it kind of sat in a basement for about 40 years. And now when we look back at it, we see it as a really special moment in history in 1969 when the world was kind of blowing up. Um, and this is, uh, there was a lot of racism and we're in the tail end of some terrible um, uh, uh, assassinations and the 60s was just so tumultuous. And this is a moment of pure black joy. So this film uh, really embodies that. And in my opinion, this section here uh, does a great job of contextualizing how we used archival footage in addition to the um, the concert footage, which is archival footage in and of itself. Uh, but we used other, other more iconic archival footage to tell this story. And again, everything you're going to see here, it's not never before seen, but we've used it in a little bit different way. So remember that things that you've seen over and over again can be really exciting when they're used differently and when you sort of recontextualize them um, in, in different pods so that you could see the same thing. Yeah, oh, I recognize that clip, but it feels different depending on how you cut it into your show. So I think that's what make this interest, makes this interesting. You're seeing my screen here? Yep. Okay, cool, cool. Let me make sure I've got audio because that's going to be important. Is that the problem with this clip? Oh, for crying out loud. You know what? I'm going to have to show you something. Um, sorry, I was looking at some. <laughs> it's another film I'm working on. Or actually, that was Selma. Uh, um, apologies, because that particular one doesn't have um doesn't have audio don't be afraid of my tabs this is how archival producers work we just think like that in big scary ways i'm gonna stop scaring sharing because this is embarrassing um where oh here it is right here right under there uh hmm hmm let me see this one, is this one silent? This one's silent. Um, the one I showed with you, um, I believe, there we go, you, got it, you. I'm in. Let me cue Thank it up. You. Sorry about that, guys. I This one has subtitles. Um, I gotta get to the end. Little Lynn manuel Miranda. Surprising little edition. Okay, here we go. Gotcha, gotcha. Share screen. Let's do this thing. Here we are. You're going to see subtitles on this. Sorry about that. Um, all right, here we go. Got to do it all if we're going to live not on the moon right here on Earth, baby. Oh, you're not sharing. Not sharing. Oh, sorry. Not sharing. Oh, yeah. not sharing just yet. There we go. Now sharing. Yep. Perfect. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, before it's too goddamn late. <laughs> Where go? Same time. Where go? Same time. 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 Same Sunday, July 20th, 1969, during the Harlem Cultural Festival, man landed on the moon. Hooray. It's a great thing for this country. I can't believe it. That just happened. It was terrific. It's a great technological achievement. It's really unbelievable. I'm very emotional. I just hope they make it back. I hope the world got closer. To I hope we all got to know each other that much more. Well, there was a large crowd gathered in Harlem this afternoon for some of the reaction there, correspondent Bill Plant. There are 40,000, perhaps 50,000 people at Mount Morris Park in Harlem, but they are not here watching the moon landing. They're here 
at the Seoul Festival, part of the third annual Harlem Cultural Festival. And for many of them, this is far more relevant than the mission of Apollo 11. What's your feeling now that the astronauts have landed safely on the moon? I think it's very important, but I don't think it's any more relevant than, you know, the Harlem Cultural Festival here. I think it's equal. What are your thoughts? As far as science goes and everybody that's involved with moon landing and astronauts, it's beautiful, you know. Like many, I could be this, is, this means more to you than that. Yeah, and much more. The cash they wasted, as far as I'm concerned, in getting to the moon could have been used to feed poor black people in Harlem and all over the place, and all over this country. So, like, you know, like, never mind the moon, let's get some of that cash in Harlem. You better change, you I think it's a waste of money. People are going hungry all over the United States. Let's do something about poverty now. Straightening out our problems. There's so many people who need help. What's up there on the moon? Nothing. It's a movie for certain people, but not for the black man in America. Well, here's the way I look at it. Like that. Black man wants to go to Africa, white man's going to the moon. I'm going to stay in Harlem with the Puerto Ricans and have me some fun. I had a dream last night and then that I went to the moon. You went to the moon? Yeah. Did you go up in uh, the Apollo? No, I went up in an Etzel. All right. <laughs> stop with the uh <laughs> actually maybe i'll leave that to screen share for just one second rowan and contextualize this for one second um just to tell you a little bit about what you're seeing here um uh essentially this clip is important to me because like we start out and you can see he's uh, our editor who's very very talented musician has incorporated the audio from the moon landing into the song. So there's a rhythmic incorporation of that, um, of the of the Apollo audio, the NASA communications um, placed into there. So every single moment that he cuts in, remember that's archival footage, that's third party footage, as well as we're essentially, for the purposes of this particular production, calling that concert footage production footage because it was licensed in a completely separate deal. So that's like essentially our camera masters is the way that you would see it. But everything else is third party inside of there. So you can see the moon footage, which is um, uh, kind of in the public domain. That's a little complicated, but because NASA is weird. But um, that's essentially American uh, uh, American footage that's owned by the government. Therefore, we can use it. Um, uh, is it comes in here, and then we cut, of course, to Cronkite. This is a very iconic shot of Cronkite where he wipes the tear. Um, most people who have spent any moments with the Apollo are familiar with the tear wipe. It's like iconic, but it feels different here again because it's being contrasted. Um, you have all these uh, specifically white people telling you how excited and how beautiful the moon landing is. And then we cut to the black people telling us, eh, I'd rather have that money right here in Harlem. So for us, it's this, it's this different use of footage. This is all, most of this, uh, footage that you're seeing here is CBS and NBC um, material that we've cut in. So the sourcing should be straightforward, um, but we did have a couple of hiccups um, with this footage. This footage here where there, where um, CBS is at the Harlem Cultural Festival is the only known footage of a news source at the festival, which is wild if you think about the number of people that were there and for the number of weekends that they were there. So the news uh, organizations were not in attendance here or when they were that footage, we, we couldn't find that footage. And the way I found this is not because I'm some brilliant person, but it's because I told somebody what I was doing and they told me, have you seen this before? So for me, this piece of footage is really iconic for me because it's a career maker for me, but also I didn't find it. My friend found it. And the only way I got my hands on it is by communicating what I'm doing. And this is something I continue to, to emphasize with Rowan's group. And I would emphasize with you as filmmakers, this is so collaborative. It's not just collaborative within your team, it's collaborative without. And when you find yourself with the instinct to, to keep things to yourself, that's um, you're probably better off sharing because people say things and can give you clues to things that you wouldn't find otherwise. So anything I would tell you um, about a film I'm doing is not going to allow you to make this 
same film I'm making necessarily, but like sharing information with people, you're always going to get more back. So I would always recommend just like be communicate about what you're doing to all kinds of different people because they can get you to different places. And then the final thing that's kind of interesting about this is this footage here. This is actually in front of the Apollo. You can see it says Sly right here because Sly and the Family Stone were actually playing at the Apollo the night of the moon landing. CBS goes to the Apollo. They took this footage, but they never aired this footage. And because they never aired it, they did not want to license it to us. So we had Quest Love, the director of this particular film, go, um, well, the way it usually works is people like me will write a plea and then Quest Love will put his own flavor, his own um, stamp on that communication. And he will be the person who directs it to um, like CBS in this case and says, why won't you license us this footage? They don't like to license things that they haven't aired because they think that it hasn't passed their journalistic muster. And so for them, they don't feel like it's their responsibility to watch every film out there and to make sure that we are meeting their journalistic standards. So they weren't licensing footage like this. Since then, they've started doing it on a case-by-case -case basis, um, partially because of film like this. You can't have this footage of Black people giving their honest opinions about the moon landing and not let it out there for the people in the present to understand the true emotions of what was happening there in the past. So in our project, we told them, and I saw Rowan had it in her slide, um, that this is a case of keeping history, holding history hostage. Um, and you know, when you say that to a news organization, they're like, wait, wait, no, no, we're cool. We're cool, we'll work with you, um, which they did. But it, there was a lot of effort involved in that. Anyway, I'm gonna throw it back to Rowan because uh, that's just sort of contextualizing this clip, which I think helps understand a little bit of what we're up to. Yeah, and I also think it's interesting that we talked about CBS and they won't like license outtakes. Well, now they do a little bit, but like you had said that ABC um, will license outtakes, but won't license anything that like was aired. So it's completely they prefer to not license their branded content because they don't want their brand any in any way diluted. So all of them have reasons that they do or don't license, and they're all at odds with one another, and they're all they all kind of make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's really and then one of the I forget which one doesn't um uh li like license to com competitors too like uh ABC also yeah. who's a Disney owned entity although ABC is um Disney is now looking to possibly divest ABC to I believe Nexstar um who is another conglomerate it's just early talks but things like those kinds of deals are things that I've always got my eye on because it's like if that were to happen that would be a major change um within the archival industry and how we go about both sourcing and licensing footage if a if a major news archive like ABC that has really chronicled the last um 80 years 70 years <laughs> of <laughs> of news history uh changes hands and it changes the access to that. That's a huge, that's hugely impactful for the entire industry. That's actually good to know as I work for a next star nations. A state oh, do you? That's right. That's right. You sure do. Yeah. So um, that's actually good to know because I, like I, I think I, I told Lizzie this, I have a huge archival room down in my basement at my, one of my stations and it's <laughs> someone organized. It's horrible. And I just want, I'm thankful I was in this program because now I'll be able to know how to like at least catalog it and um, use it in, in, in the future and for other filmmakers to use that footage just sitting down there. Um, but I'll get back to the presentation and I want to thank you, Lizzie, for sharing that. Cause I just think that's an amazing clip. Um, like you said, uh, I'll take that, I'll take a red Fox. It wasn't licensable. And I loved quest loves, um, uh, quote, like, how can you hold history hostage like this? That just like, it just hit me right here. And so I'm glad we were able to share that with you guys. Cause that is just an amazing, amazing clip. Um, definitely watched the film. It's like an actual good film. I actually watched it after we talked about it because I've never heard of it because um, I didn't watch the Oscars that year. So um, yeah. Um, but now I want to talk about rights for archival film um, and the licenses because we we're just talking about um, the different types um, with ABC and NBC. Um, but basically you really want all media worldwide in perpetuity perpetuity I can't say that word sorry in perpetuity um perpetuity. yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you um so basically that means that you want all media you want a uh, dvd um streaming um broadcast um vhs anything 
um, so that you can stream, you can license that film, um, that the the archival film anywhere um, and within your film um, on all media. And then worldwide is anywhere. So any, like if you, if it goes on streaming, if it goes on Netflix, that means it can be streamed in um, UK, um, anywhere, anywhere in the US um, and then as like other countries as well. And then in perpetuity, like at forever. Um, but then there's also, that can, that can obviously be different um, in Europe. It's what you have to specify what media. So if you want it to be VHS only, it can be VHS only, which I found really interesting. So I don't think of anyone using VHS tapes, but it can be DVD, it can be streaming only broadcast. Um, and it depends because I know we talked about the BBC and the BBC because they deal with a lot of um, American filmmakers. They actually do have all media as well, um, which I thought was interesting. And then the theatrical release as well, you, that's, a, um, a, that's part of the license. And you can have a limited theatrical release or um, a whole like theatrical release. Um, and depending on what kind of theatrical release you want, if any at all, um, can be costly. It can be can differ in terms of pricing. Um, theatrical, if you want to um, be up for an Academy Award, it has to have at least some sort of theatrical release. So a lot of a lot of um, a lot of like films will have a, at least a limited theatrical, if nothing at all. Um, but it can be costly. Um, we talked about how it it's like sixty three dollars for per second for thirty second minimum minimum. Um, so that could be like fifty five thousand six hundred dollars, or that's like the lowest price, and it can go from eighty four dollars. It can really vary. Um, but we talked about budgets and budgets. Um, three hundred thousand is what is the probably the best. Um, to see when you enter a film as an archival producer. You I, I just want to say that the Netflix executives who were on that particular call kind of lost their marbles when I said that. <laughs> but that's also like, let's just be clear that that's a film that you that's going to have archival from tip to tail and sometimes have two or three levels of archival at the same time, like audio that you're paying for that's separate from video that you're also paying for, or maybe even split screen where you've got two two pieces of archive playing at the same time. So when you're doing these kinds of things like Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power or Arthur Ashe or um, Phil Oaks or, or this film here, it's you're gonna need a large budget to do that. But if you're just looking to license two or three pieces of archive to bolster your project, that's a whole different deal. But let's say if you wanna do a whole archival film and you wanna be awards eligible, that's a good number to start. Yeah, um, I think I think that's just really interesting because like when you it, archival film is like not is not cheap, um, and I think some people think it's the easiest way to go, but it 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 can't it it can and it can't be so um, yeah, but um, and then it also needs to be careful like who owns the copyright. We talked about this in class in our um, in our program, and it's about a it's a monkey selfie. Um, you can read more about it because I have it li linked here, but. Um, basically a monkey owns the copyright to this picture and I just because PETA um, sued the um, photographer and PETA won so that's that's really interesting if you want to read more about it definitely please do because it's it's just it just shows like that um, people who own the footage may not also own the copyright and so that's very specific um, and then fair use um, is can be used um, and that's why you have lawyers on standby to make sure that what you, to double check to make sure that that uh, that footage you are using can be used with within fair use. Um, and that this is a this is a link. It's the Center for Media and Social Impact, and it is a um, website that just shows all like the background information. It's the best practices in fair use. And if you go all the way down here, um, this is kind of like the four major like how you can use fair use within your film. Um, definitely give it a read. It's really interesting. Um, I think my favorite, like when I thought I found the most interesting was that if you capture any like um, posters or anything in the background of something you film, um, that can be fair use. Cause that is, you are using copyrighted footage, but you can claim that as fair use because it was in the background of something you shot. Um, so yeah, but definitely check out that website if you are interested in archival film. Um, just so you can use the fair use. And then for the second day, so that was all the first day. And then the second day we talked about logging. 
And if you took any of Shane's classes, you know this this kind of uh, what what this image shows is <laughs> blogging. We used Google Excel for this one, um, but you can also use um, uh, what was it? Um, what is it, Lizzie? Um, I like Airtable. It's Air really Table. elegant and it has a lot of pivot table functionings. And it turns out that not just for archival projects, but films across the board are using Airtable more and more um, in film production companies. It can do everything from your finances, uh, but also it's got really elegant uh, ways of of um, cross-referencing and what we used to call pivot tabling information, which is essentially if I were to click on one piece of information um, that's shared across loads of different records, it would give me all the information about that. Um, it's a uh, cataloging software that's just phenomenal. Very pretty too. This, as you can see, this uh, Excel Google Sheets, this Google Sheets is a little uh, clunky. Uh, it's still doing the job we need it to do. But um, but it's not as elegant as Airtable. Yeah, Airtable is um, expensive too. So this is like a better, a cheaper way if you don't, if yeah. you can't afford it. This is a free way. way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try to find the one that's gonna use the less money. Um, but this is a really great way um, to catalog it, which is good for when you get the edit decision list of the EDL, and um, you're you can look at what what in in the in the um, edit you can see what um, what archival film or or image or anything that's used um, in that in the in the timeline in the time code. Um, so this is so the way that it's named is that it's used with the media, which is F for film, um, A for audio, H for headline, and um, S for still. And then you go to the asset number, which is one two three four. Um, and then the version number, which can be different um, depending on which version you use. You could find something, you can find the same clip maybe somewhere else that might be a little cheaper. Um, and then you have the date. Um, so the date, the, put the year first, ABD, always be dating. That was something I learned. Um, and then um, you put the you put the year first and then the month and then the day. So this clip here was from March um, 17th, 1968. And then um, if you don't know the year, um, you put just double zeros because you just don't know the month or day, but you know the year, at least try to know the year, um, 1980, but that just shows that you don't know the exact day, but you at least know when, when, when it was filmed. Um, and then you have the vendor who holds copyright. So in this case, um, this Bundy clip is from, uh, Getty and then, um, the source ID number or the mastering source. So uh, if I go on to Getty, which I do have it pulled up, I can have this number here and this is the clip. So this is the only, this is the clip that has this number as like, this is the only number that if you search this, it's gonna pull up this clip and you can find all the information. So January 1st, 1980, that means that they don't know when it was filmed, but they know it was in 1980 and the clip length, where it was, lo um, the location of where it's shot. And you get like all this uh, information down here. If you go on like, uh, like a website like this. Um, but then you also have the short descriptions. So you have that code and then you have the short description um, and you put that into um, Google and you can do a concatenate and you can make it so that you have this beautiful um, asset name so that it's easier to um, log and to make sure that you have the right clip when it's supposed to be, when you get that edit decision list. And then when you send all of this to the lawyers, if you're using fair use, um, then that way they can also see that as well. So it's a great way to just organize everything. Um, Airtable is preferred, but again, Google Google Sheets is a great, cheaper way to use that. Um, so then I wanna talk about day three, which we had amazing panelists. Um, we had Alyssa and Beth, um, they came and talked to us about networking. I'm um, just talking about like what they wanna look for when they're looking, when they wanna hire people and assistance. And it was really like, they want someone who can collaborate, who um, has a personality, who's willing to learn and um, just wants to be there and, and yeah, learn. And I just found that really fun um, to talk to people who are in the industry who um, like talked about what they did and hear how they got into archival as well. Um, and that was, that was a really great um, discussion. But then I really enjoyed Stephanie's um, discussion, which was about using AI and documentaries and how it can be good and it can also be really bad. 
Um, you can use AI to help digitize things, which I found really interesting. Or in the terms of like logging, um, you can have it have it so that like you don't have to type in all of that stuff or find a screenshot. You can have um, AI use do that for you. And we did this exercise, and um, I'm gonna have you guys do one as well. But Stephanie shared this clip with us, and I have it linked here. But it's from the University of Washington, and it is um San Francisco like it's a steamboat um and people are waiting and we used AI to kind of recreate that Im image and while this is the historically accurate image this was taken by someone um and at that time um the AI one was obviously not so it's very fun it was very it wasn't fun but it was very interesting to see how AI can be used and how documentary some documentary filmmakers will use AI instead of actually using actual film. Um, so I'm going to have you do that. I have an AI link right here. I'm going to send it and you guys can create your own. See if you guys can create your own image and then I'm going to show the image. This is the one, this is a different one. Um, so this one is from, I think 1929. It's yeah, campus day showing students gathered on a quad um, at the University of Scranton, um, University of Scranton, University of Washington, sorry. Um, and I want you to try to use, using words and using, um, and you have to change also the crayon to um, photo, but you can use this um, 1900s black and white photo or something using words um, to type that in and try to recreate this image using AI. And then I really want to see, like, if you want to send them in, I want to see how, how well you guys do and see if you guys can do it. Um, so I'm going to stop share and you guys can do it. I can also, I did it. Lizzie, if you want to do it too, you can. <laughs> Your mic's on. I, I subscribe. I actually subscribe to, um, open AI, uh, because there have been a couple of situations where I'm working on narrative features, not documentary features, <laughs> um, where I'm interested in, uh, I was doing this bowling feature, silly comedy about bowling and they needed to essentially to recreate like who is the first black bowler um and they wanted it to sort of be a parody so I was like let's see what AI can do for us just to create this thing um it's right now it's the wild west in AI there's actually no um copyrights within AI generative uh, generated images. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about generative AI, which is very different than the software that would help us log or um, make EDLs more easy to digest. Um, but essentially for generative AI, they can source from almost anywhere and currently it hasn't been litigated. So anything that's created um, is not copyrightable and the copyright holders whose material has been mined is not uh is not uh, they don't hold any rights either now you've heard sarah silverman is suing and several other famous people are suing uh to try to protect their um their own ip intellectual property they want to protect their ip and to not have it mined without their permission for ai so right now we're in this really dangerous situation where uh, there are no rules. <laughs> so we can try to create an image like that if we want and just like use that instead. Stephanie's talk was all about how that's really dangerous to recreate history in that way, how things can enter the historical record um, that aren't part of the historical record and how that can taint how we all understand going forward, what history actually is, and also how the the spiders, the mines themselves are biased. Um, she was talking about how when she tried to recreate an image of somebody from the 1800s, everybody was, everybody was like these beautiful skin, su skinny supermodels uh, because there's a bias of imagery um, in the, on the internet. Uh, which is this uh, because the AI the spiders can only mine what's already been digitized so they're using <laughs> things like Instagram to help them inform what um what potentially you know a, a a field worker in the 1800s looked like and so the images are not accurate in any possible way 
and you can see all these digital artifacts as well. So anyway, I subscribe because I find it interesting, kind of funny and weird. I'm also a little freaked out by it, but I also kind of welcome our AI overlords. I think they're going to make life a lot easier over time and there's still going to be work. There's still going to be work. I mean, certainly we, uh, you know, uh, certainly it's going to change, but hell it's, cha I barely had the internet in college. So <laughs> it's already changed. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> the speed with which this change is going to affect us though is breathtaking. And so we just need to constantly be aware of it. So again, stay in touch with what's happening legally and what's happening um, uh, because these cases are going to happen fast and furious and it's going to change the way that we can use AI if we'd like. But anyway, the open AI, I'll put the open AI that I use, uh, in the chat so you guys can, can see it. Um, I use a program, it's called Dolly and it creates images based on text. That one was really good. I tried to use it, but I didn't realize you needed a subscription. So I was like, oh, this one's free. I can use this. You one. found a free one. They're everywhere. And what's crazy is how good these look. I mean, if you look closely, it's not going to be as good. And especially you're not going to get the resolution that you need because part of what it's doing is it's is it's um blending frames. So it's never going to look the same as as a but I'm looking at a couple of these that Brad did and it's, it's impressive. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Jacob, that's a really interesting point that you make and something that we talk about a lot. I did, um, Jacob saying here that, uh, the editing photos together in any, like you're recontextualizing things anyway, and it changes things, but there's something very different about knowing that you're using images that were actually created in history and that the physical object itself is something that was created um, at a time in a place that has value. Um, and certainly the way that we generate newspaper headlines and things like that in documentary is already changing things to some degree, but we try, there's a set of ethics in documentary that are a little different than journalism. Um, for instance, in Ted Bundy, or even in the World War One, is a great example. Uh, the United States government filmed a lot of training exercises that have now sort of entered the record and people use them as World War I battles all the time. They look like World War I battles. They feel like World War I battles. When you're trying to visually represent a World War I battle, you're going to see a lot of people, if you go on Critical Past, you're going to see a lot of these and you can't tell what's a training exercise and when they're actually in the Muse Argonne. It's difficult to tell. Like, so I will say um, that it's important Poor, I can't, I could not also get past the first page of that book. My husband read it cover to cover like three times. Um, <laughs> um, what I will say is that it's, is it's, it's, um, it's a difficult argument and it's a slippery slope. Should we be using these training exercises to tell a story about World War I? Or are we allowed to, to take some leeway in the process of our storytelling? And I think one of the things is all about letting your viewer know what you know about the material. So part of it is just about transparency and saying to the viewer, hey, this is an Andy Warhol documentary where we AI recreated Andy Warhol's voice. I had a harder time, although I love the film, the Anthony Bourdain film Roadrunner, they used AI to recreate his voice. And I couldn't tell where they did and where they didn't because there was so much footage of him anyway and so much of him talking. So it was unclear to me when they used AI and when they didn't. And I wish they would have made that a little bit more clear just for the transparency. Um, but they used his AI to recreate his voice of words that he wrote. So it's not, I don't know, like where's the line there? Where is the line? Is that wrong? Is that not wrong? I think they should have been a bit more transparent about it is all I would say. So I think the conversation is just about transparency, but these are things I'm sure you're talking about in all your classes, um, ethics and, or just in all your seminars, um, meetups, the D word we're talking, all the documentary associations are talking about it. So it's something to keep in touch with. Yeah, I want to share um the letter that um Stephanie and you shared with us. This letter because we talked we'd obviously like the SAG um the SAG strikes and the writer strikes like we're so I mean there was they were all over you know everyone's talking about it especially within our like groups of like filmmakers um so this is a letter that um 
they shared with us in the in our program um, that just kind of talked about what um, Lizzie just talked about. There's the Archival Producers Alliance who kind of put this together about why generative AI is is risky and a slippery slope and how can we um, manage it. Um, yeah. Lizzie, do you want to talk more about that? I feel like um, you, because I know you, I saw you signed it. So if you want to talk more about yeah, that. Yeah, I helped write it and signed it. And I've just been uh, like more and more AI is just entering our world and it's happening pretty fast. I don't feel like I was having the same conversation even a year ago. So it's a little strange. Um, but essentially we're just trying, yeah, Steph, Steph actually just fully read the letter and I, and I love it if you guys could just see what she's, uh, what we're all saying here is just that, um, just that we're concerned about, um, everything from deep fakes to distorting history. And it's not that we think that this shouldn't happen at all, but that it should happen with transparency and with conversations and that it, we should not embrace this so quickly that we don't take a breath and think about what those ethics really mean and how we feel about all of this. And this needs to happen across the industry, but archival producers are uniquely situated to really be the gatekeepers of this kind of material. We see what goes into the edit. We see what comes out of the edit. Um, we are logging and trying to keep track of what all of this material is. So to some degree, when I'm looking at a film, I see it as a shot by shot. I can seeing the gestalt is a gift that I get usually a year later because I'm, <laughs> I'm not able to, I'm not able to see a film as its whole entity until after, um, after I've dealt with each requisite part that I have to license individually. So, um, for us, having the research practices, having the production, the post-production, and then the legal practices that we have to incorporate as as parts of what we do, um, we're there at the beginning, we're there at the end. We can watch these things enter. We can flag when they're dangerous. We can also say that um, we can also encourage transparency. And there's also right now, there's actually... Uh, a we had a lawyer come speak to us and he told us that um, currently if you have AI in your films, uh, that the copyright office cannot give you a copyright for what you've got because the, because it's, it's so slippery right now. So I, the, he read something very specific and Rowan, I can try to get that to you to share with the group. Yeah. Uh, what exactly that, that what's written into law right there at the copyright offices. Um, but just to say, this is still something that is in development and is going to be, um, it, it is going to be litigated shortly and probably quickly because there's a lot of noise around it. Uh, people worried about their own IP um, all the way to people worried about uh, tainting the historical record, um, which as we've, noted and discussed is already happening right so <laughs> it's it's slippery it's difficult it's something i by no means an expert in but it's something that i find myself discussing over and over and over again at this point it's top of everybody's mind yeah and um if you did want to talk more about it i do have um here some of the listeners organizations like we didn't talk about the d word but um there's the documentary producers alliance archival producer alliance um, the Association of Moving Image Archivists. This is going to be in the Slack. I'm going to post it. So if you guys wanted to talk more about this, um, this is like their, these are like listservs that people talk about these things. So um, definitely keep that conversation going because it like we're in a different time right now. Like this is definitely going to um, just, it's just going to be part of our lives. So we got to just figure out how to use it and how, what the best way is. Um, and then lastly, if you guys, um, uh, thank you for coming one. But then if you guys wanted to um, talk to me a more about this program, my email's below. Um, and I they're going to do this again, definitely. So please apply. It's a great program. You're going to meet amazing people. Everyone on the call is just amazing. Um, and we're now in a Facebook group. We still like, we still talk, even though it's been a week later, but um, just trying to share our content and support each other because we're all just emerging filmmakers right now um, and trying to get our, our feet off the ground. But um, Lizzie, if, they, if people want to um, get in touch with you, what's the best way? 
Um, I mean, certainly you can email me. I get a lot of correspondence right now. Things have been going a little nuts, but also like I'm always trying to get back to people. So if you have something very specifically, I'll put my email here. Um, if you have archival specific questions, <laughs> I mean, I can't answer everything. It's kind of like if you have ever sat in on a fair use seminar, everybody wants a piece of those lawyers, I swear. And they all want to ask their very specific question and get like a very specific answer. And the answer is always, it depends. So, um, uh, but you know, archive is a little more straightforward <laughs> except for the fair use questions. So if there's something specific that you want to ask me about, I'm happy to try to field that. Um, sometimes it's been a crazy kind of year. So uh, sometimes I'm a little slower than I'd like to be uh, to respond. Because now I used to do one film at a time and now I'm just doing lots of different things at once, which is I feel like a post COVID reality for a lot of people. Um, uh, and especially with a work from home, uh, you know, production used to be a very much in-person uh, thing. And now we've learned Summer of Soul was cut it was the first film I ever cut remotely. Um, so, you know, we've all had to learn these remote workflows and work systems and archive is uniquely situated to do that. Um, so I don't go into an office. I'm alone a lot. <laughs> Doesn't totally suit me, but okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, that all that being said, um, I'm always working remotely, which means I'm just kind of doing like 20 things at once. Uh, so I'll do my best to get around to any questions or definitely like you can get with me on LinkedIn too. A lot of people, LinkedIn, I don't know. When did that get so big? It's huge. Everybody's on it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's a big conversation. I feel like I'm seeing my archives post really cool things on LinkedIn that I wouldn't know about otherwise. Um, so it's just another way to sort of call information and Stephanie gave Rowan and the cohort and, and Rowan's correct, including Rowan, the students in that cohort are just like remarkable people. Um, so it's really interesting to get in with all of them, but Stephanie's advice to them, Steph Jenkins was to read the trades and to, and to make connections with people. Um, and this is like, even this kind of connection here is really valuable. You know, I think film is nothing if not collaborative. So all of us meeting all the time, I'm constantly, I want to, I want to do these kinds of meetings all the time, just to meet people and see what people are doing, tell them what I'm doing so they can tell me where they've seen footage that I can <laughs> then not take credit for finding, but also find for my film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so true. Yeah. But if you guys also want to email me too, cause like, I'll be happy to take, I know like Lizzie, but I'll, I don't really get a lot of emails. I'm so like little a little like baby filmmaker, I feel like. So definitely if you have any questions about the program, um, email me. It was, a, it was an amazing experience and I'm so happy to be a part of it. And Lizzie was an amazing facilitator. Um, so, and I hope you do it again. And I think they, I'm assuming they've asked you to do it again. I hope. Um, I, they have to, you know, it was a big thing for them and it was the first time they've done anything like it. And so they're waiting on some responses and then they're going to, because they did make it free for people too. Yeah. They're looking for people to come into this space. So if anybody's interested in moving into this space, like, like very specifically, it's really, there's a lot of work out there for people like us and it's creative it's a creative space, but it's also a technical space. So I just feel like I flex about 10 different muscles on any given day. I'm ne I'm never doing exactly the same thing all the time. That's not to say some of it isn't rote and a little boring and a little bureaucratic, um, but that's unfortunately what work is. <laughs> Even the most creative work <laughs> can be all of those things. So, you know, if anybody wants to ask anything about it, that's fine. Oh okay. yeah, Jordan, you have a question? Hi, um, so my name's Jordan. I graduated from Ithaca College with a documentary degree. So I kind of come specifically from that background. And I think part of the training that lent itself to my education was was the idea of of finding a character and and seeing like hu the humanity of a person that you're displaying um for your audience and understanding that yes they're giving maybe a social or 
or some sort of political statement to your audience, depending on what you're saying, but they have to have some sort of appeal. And especially that's that Summer of Soul clip you showed, like, A, that film is, if you haven't seen it in a theater, you need to get into a theater and listen to that soundscape. It's ridiculous. It's magical. Um, but regardless, like, I felt like that was such an exemplary show of how archival is, is capable of showing us those characters that we maybe crave, even in just like fiction. Um, so it brought up the question for me of like, as an archivist, while you're doing this research, what, what hat are you wearing? Are you getting a list of the assets that your editor, your team wants, and you're kind of viewing it as like, okay, what can I get? Or when you're finding these assets, are you kind of wearing a creative hat where you're saying, ooh, this clip has some cool people in it, and I would love to see them use it? Yeah, both. Um, I'd say for Summer of Soul, they told me almost nothing. Uh, that that was a sort of sandbox film. A lot of the stuff I work on is a little bit more people aren't sure how they're going to do it. Sometimes they don't even think they can. And they're like, oh, that won't exist. And it's like, no, it, it exists. <laughs> you gotta, you'll be surprised what exists. Um, but um, certainly for Summer of Soul, we understood that there was certain uh, moments that we needed to speak about. And actually the moon landing was super low hanging fruit for me because, uh, you know, one of these concerts happened on the day of the moon landing and you can't not talk about that, especially because it is such an issue literally between black and white America at the time, which is, which is a theme that we're constantly trying to get at. So like that it's, it, in knowing what exists, I've licensed the, the Apollo footage before, um, and knowing that each of the networks has their own, huge uh uh has a whole uh huge um uh set of moon reactions and things like that so finding the moon reactions and things like that was something that I knew I was going to have to do and I get excited because I like go into the archives and I you know I hadn't done that before so it's like oh what's gonna what's even gonna show up but anybody who had done a moon film before had probably seen those clips before so it's like when you start doing this you start to get more and more familiar stuff so I did know like the tear wipe this is something I've seen used over and over again, the same way you've seen certain clips of Martin Luther King um, or Stokely Carmichael or RFK. You see sort of the same things over and over and over again. So some of those things that are very easy and I know what to do. Some of them, uh, they'll ask me specifically, I need Sly looking like he's just off a bender. It's like, cool, cool, I can find that. <laughs> actually got kind of a low hanging fruit too. Um, but, or they might say something to me. Um, they might say something to me uh, like, hey, we're thinking of, of this area. Can you find what you can find? I like it when people empower me to do exactly what you just said, Jordan, which is to go out and be like, this looks super interesting. Can we, can we shove these people in there? Um, but it's not always the job. Like some, some people have more control than others. I did a film on the grunge era, which you'd think would be fun, but I don't love the nineties. The nineties is really tough because it's prosumer uh, time and prosumer time means uh, ugly footage. It means it's under somebody's bed. It's like, God knows who took it. Uh, rights are all over the place. Everybody's like cutting between pans. I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> the 90s is the 90s is nutty but anyhow um with with that those filmmakers knew what they wanted and I felt a little limited in my ability to go out and find what I wanted to find so it just depends on the filmmaker but as you as a filmmaker or an editor I mean when you talk to your archival producer I just also want to just like uh, distinguish myself from an archivist who's the person who actually does the cataloging in an institution um, but as, as somebody who works in archive as an archival producer or an archival adjacent professional I don't know how else you call it. Um, um, I, I do it all those different ways yeah somebody tells me or I have to figure it out it, it, either way you're going to figure it out it's usually communication with the editor more than the producer or the director to be honest because the editor is like cutting and they they find a hole and they want to fill that, but they're afraid to go on the internet, which they should be. Um, so they want me to find them something licensable. That's the best way. Yeah. Um, I have a question as well. So I'm just curious. I know, Lizzie, you mentioned that this is like, um, is definitely like a growing 
part of the industry and that you work on a variety of things at once. Um, like job wise, you see that, you know, like a lot of the jobs are network based where you're working on a variety of projects or it's more like a freelance type of a deal. I'm just kind of curious, you know, if there is one way it leans. Uh, I think for me, it's also a late career thing. I'm like older. So I've been doing this for a while. And I think, um, you know, when you are more coming up um, and I don't even want to say entry level, but like early career, um, that there's more opportunity to do one thing and to be in that one thing. Although what a lot of production houses will do, some of my favorite production houses, and this is how I came up, is they'll have you wearing many hats. So you'd be maybe doing some archival research and working with somebody like me, but also maybe helping with production coordination and other things. It kind of gives you that opportunity to like work across the different parts and decide what you like and what you don't like anyway, which I find like career development is a bit of a subtractive exercise anyway, right? You might do the, but I used to, I was doing a lot of production at first and I was like, man, I hate this. God, I hate this. There's so much pressure. <laughs> it's so hard. Like <laughs> About hundred, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and loads of people's time are all hinging on the fact that I ordered the right lunch. I mean, it's like too much. <laughs> I just can't with all that. So for me, archive was a little bit more like, okay, okay, okay. This is like a slower roll. It's not quite the same intensity. Um, although it's really intense at the end, <laughs> very intense. Um, so, so I think if you're earlier in your career and you want to work with somebody like me and you, then you could probably be just fully on one project and be devoted to that one project. There's a lot of series out there right now, a lot of true crime and some true crime is very, very good. Um, I know that sounds scary, but like one of my favorite projects I did and uh, Rowan knows this is, is a Bundy project. It's just really, it was really good. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's not Summer of Soul. It's not Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power. What it is, though, is it's really enter entertaining and visually interesting archive. So, you know, you want to do, um, I can think of five or six different series that are like staffing up now and they're looking for entry level people who can log and who can keep track of things. And you'll move up very quickly if you like doing those things because people who are good at that sort of cataloging and keeping an organized mind, um, you're usually good at all aspects of filmmaking if you're good at that because that's kind of what it all is anyway. <laughs> there always needs to be the people who are detail oriented. Um, that's always gonna be a an important part of it. So I, I, I would say like certainly if you don't want like that idea of doing 10 different things, you don't have to. But also sometimes with archive two, it's heavy in the beginning, it's a little less heavy in the middle and it's heavy again at the end. We're like reverse everybody else. Um, like all the production people will be losing their minds and they'll be like, why are you just so lazy over there? And we're like, no, our day will come and everybody will be tired and there will be no money. And there'll be, and <laughs> you'll all be asleep and we will be staying up all night, every night to try to figure this out. So knowing that you can kind of weave projects together when this one's going, we're gonna have fewer archival needs. This one's ramping up and try to piece it together like that. It's not ideal, this is stupid capitalism. I mean, we have to have healthcare, we have to have <laughs> these other things. So it's not always ideal, but it's certainly possible and there's enough work out there to make it happen, I think. Contact me, I will I can help. <laughs> yeah, thank you, no, it's just, you know, interesting. I'm just curious kind of, you know, that specific space, so, but appreciate it. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a there's just a lot because there's a lot of manual labor involved in it right now of finding the objects, logging the objects, getting or the assets, getting them into the edit, tracking them through the edit, and then getting them out and getting them licensed. It's a whole part. And even I'm telling you, even like these feature films, these narrative feature films didn't used to think they needed somebody and they just let some editor do it and they get all screwed up every time. So it's like they've started hiring people too. And I work in the ad space too. I work in advertisements now, which is very strange. Some days I'll just be looking at TikTok all day. That's not my jam. <laughs> but also, 
I'll take your money to, to like find user generated content for you. Okay. So it's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that these skills play out for a career. Um, documentary is my favorite way. Uh, but the skill also can grow with you. I mean, I've considered law school at this point because it's like, I know too much. And why are the, you know, lawyers are getting my day rate by the hour. So, <laughs> you know, not worth it though. <laughs> put some, put some hours towards the credits. Yeah. <laughs> the entry level checked off. Yeah, exactly. Lizzie, do you have any recommendations for where people can look for work? Uh, definitely. I would say Media Mavens is a, a, a great spot where people are posting things. I know Facebook is not that great, but there's a Facebook group called I Need a Producer. Uh, there's women working in reality TV, which is not just about reality TV, it turns out. Women working in reality TV is a lot of documentary people and people working in all across all nonfiction content. Um, I will also say that entering into the archival space, it does not have to be purely documentary. Um, it, it, there's There are entry level positions in this uh, in this space all across the industry. So anything you can find... Um, in that direction, but the D word, I know they're often posting, um, being in touch with production companies where you admire their work, radical media, imagine documentaries, story syndicate. These are all New York based because I'm New York based. Um, but these are companies where you can go to them and say, look, I have some entry level experience. I'm, I'd like just to be a P I'm happy to be an archival assistant. And they're going to be like, you want to do what? <laughs> and um, you may have to do that three or four times if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, but certainly continuing to reach out to people that you admire, people that you've seen that have made archival films that you want to be a part of um, reading, always read the credits. Steph said the same thing, but I never allow uh, myself to get knocked out of the credits. I read, every, I read the sound people's names. Partially because like, I want to know, do I know that guy um, or woman? Do I know her? Because Barbara Koppel is a sound person. Um, but like <laughs> to, knowing who's in the space and then contacting those people and say, wow, this work was really powerful. Um, do you have any other opportunities? I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Um, so LinkedIn is great for that too. And if you want to work within some of the like more established places like ABC News Productions or CBS News Productions or Peacock has its own documentary uh, wing, those jobs are almost always going to be listed on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a a pretty great space. I, 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 don't, I don't love having to keep up with any more social media, but it really consolidates across a lot of different spaces to give you the one thing. It can lead you down a lot of different holes. So don't sleep on LinkedIn. <laughs> Not that anybody is. I mean, I think it's doing fine without me promoting it. <laughs> and in New York City, are you in the Post Alliance? Is that like a good I'm networking? i not. Thing? Should I? Be? I'll join anything. Okay, maybe. You should be in the Post Alliance. <laughs> I'm a joiner. I like, I like being part of a group. I like being part of more groups. So I'll look into that. Um, I would definitely say that a lot of people who have experience in post-production, uh, a lot of post-producers, post-soups end up doing archival by default because the rest of the crew has all left. Like everybody's gone. A production's over and you got to license this stuff. So those people end up doing it. And so so there's a real overlap between post-production and archival in that and way. If, if you haven't mentioned it yet, this goes for not just documentary, like TV shows, like everything, everything. I'm telling you, I've done, um, I, I, I shoved like six pieces of archive into Minari, which was a Korean film. I didn't know those guys. It was an A24 production. Um, they were Korean. They called me out of nowhere. I was like, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just like, uh, the, all kinds of different spaces. There's also a whole company called Nickerson, that does this just for advertisements. And I can't understand whatever, why the advertising companies will call me because Nickerson can do it. And then I met some people from Nickerson and they charge like 8,000 gazillion times more than I do. So it turns out that even though I feel like I'm charging more than I can make in documentary, 
um, Nickerson makes it, it charges even more. So if you're an individual, you can, you can make money. There's, there's money to be made in this space. And I know that none of us got into documentary to get rich and I'm certainly not getting rich. I'll tell you that. Um, but it, there is a, a career growth potential, which is something that you don't always feel when you're in a field, when you're in a field like this. Um, so again, that's part of what the DART seminar is meant to, to drive home is the, the sort of growth potential. And also, also they want to involve more producers and editors to understand more about archival so that it can be less of a sticky, yucky process. So we had a lot of Rowan's cohort were editors and graphics people and whatever, and their understanding of archive growing benefits the entire production. So even, even if you don't intend to go this direction, having a really great basis of what it is that this is so that it doesn't get you all stuck up at the end of a film, because you can really get messed up if you've got unlicensable things and like your, your picture locked and you've got to find something the exact same length to shove in your sound design is locked. Everything's locked and suddenly you have to swap a clip but you can't find something that's truly equivalent, it can be really difficult. So you want to be sure that you're ahead of all of that. That's why it's not just the whole career of it. It's the, it's going to fix everything. Uh, it's going to be a piece of everything that you're doing. And that goes for sound people too, because of course there's a lot of third party sound out there and music licensing is not what I do, but it's this it's kind of the same, but it's harder. I would say <laughs> that's all about connections. That's who, you know, who you can call in a different way. Well, does anyone else have any last minute questions? All right. Rowan, do you have anything else you need to do to tie this up? No, I just want to say thank you to Lizzie for um, helping me speak about this and sharing all the footage because it's amazing it's an amazing clip like I said and we talked about that but just thank you for coming and being here and meeting everybody and talking about your experience on um on documentaries because I really appreciate it I really appreciate you Rowan you are one of the spectacular people who was there and when Rowan was like will you come talk to us I was like yeah <laughs> I wasn't like oh maybe I was like yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, if anybody again I get excited talking to people so thank you Rowan for inviting me it's really nice oh, thank you you can come every week yeah. <laughs> my neighbors will be psyched <laughs> 30 events a year you can come wow. that's, great. that's so cool that's so cool yeah if any of you get up in archival creek you just email me I can at least point you in the right direction <laughs> I live in Archive Creek. <laughs> cool. Right. Thank you both so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Great. Good night, everybody. Bye.